All right, Maggie, we are live on YouTube and on Zoom. Feel free to do a short intro as people start to trickle in. Okay, great. All right, Maggie, we are live on YouTube and on Zoom. Hello there, everyone. My name's Maggie here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. Welcome. We're excited to bring a Sports Home Learning Program to you all at home. We know we're in some strange times right now, but we are excited to bring the fort to you, and we hope you are all staying safe, staying healthy at this time. So in the meantime, um, we're going to share a little bit of history about this place. This program's title is Careers Past and Present. So we'll be going over a little bit about the jobs that would have been here at Sutter's Fort in the 1840s, and a little bit about how those jobs in the 1840s connect to today in 2020. But first, I want to address a little bit about how I will be interacting with you all today. It's a little bit different than how we would have been doing it in person. So the main way I'll be interacting with you today is through the uh, raised hand feature. It's likely going to be in the middle of your screen at the bottom. So I'll be asking you the occasional question and go ahead and raise your hand when I indicate that. And you might notice that I am not in a uh, usual state parks uniform that you might have seen in some of these other Ports home learning programs. Um, and that's because part of my job um, interpreting the historic site is to dress in period attire. So I'm excited to do that here with you all today in these digital memes. So again, here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park, I'm Maggie bringing the fort to you. And I want to go over a little bit of the background of the fort before we jump into talking about and seeing some of those careers. So the fort was established in 1839. Now this is where I'm going to test that raised hand feature that some of you have. So go ahead and raise your hand if you think or if you know if California was a part of Mexico in 1839. So go ahead and raise those hands. If you think California was a part of Mexico in the year of 1839. All right. Okay. Now, once you've raised that hand, go ahead and, and lower that hand back down. I'm gonna ask, do you think that California was a part of the United States in 1839. Let's see, let's see who thinks which on that one. Okay. Well, those of you that said Mexico would be correct. So when John Sutter arrived in 1839, California was a part of Mexico at the time. This is Alta, California. Now, Sutter's Fort here is in the city of Sacramento. So as we are traveling along today, you might be able to see up beyond the fort's walls, some modern buildings peeking up in the background. And so that definitely indicates to you that the urban city grew up around this historic site. And so I want you to go ahead and raise your hand if you've been to Sacramento or if you know where Sacramento, California is. Go ahead and raise those hands for me if you know where Sacramento is or have ever been to Sacramento. Okay, fair amount of you. Now, Sacramento, we are not right next to the ocean. So one of the modes of transportation to get to the Pacific Ocean would be traveling by the riverways. 
And so that is how John Sutter got to this area in California, the inland area, is he used the riverways to navigate. And he would have started out by Yerba Buena. We call that San Francisco today. But might be a question that you're thinking, why did John Sutter establish the site here in the interior of California? So part of that is going to have to do with establishing some agricultural businesses. And so some of the jobs that we're gonna talk about here today are gonna to deal with those agricultural industries. Now go ahead and raise your hand if you know what agriculture means. So if you know what agriculture means, go ahead and raise that hand on your screen. Okay, good. So agriculture is the science, the study, the use of farming. So we're gonna talk about some of those components on our visit here today. So we are actually going to take a little journey across the courtyard here, and we will be going past that original central building that dates back to 1840. So we are gonna go mobile now. I'm gonna change the view here so that you can see what I am seeing right now. Now think about how you think these buildings may have been constructed. So this original building is made out of type of mud brick. So where we are heading to now is the blacksmith shop. So the blacksmith, very, very important profession um, in the 1800s and especially out in these environments in the 1840s where they don't really have a lot of markets around. The closest port was in Yerba Buena, San Francisco, about a 10 day boat ride on the river from where we are today. All right. So go ahead and raise those virtual hands for me. If you've ever heard of a blacksmith or say you've seen a blacksmith in action, Go ahead and raise your hand for me if you've ever seen a blacksmith in action. A lot of you, great. So we're here in the blacksmith shop and we will talk briefly about some of the things you're seeing in here. So if you've got a piece of paper, a pen, pencil, marker, crayon, anything you can really write with, um, write down what types of tools you're noticing um, in this view here. So blacksmiths were very important with working with metal and creating all sorts of iron goods. And blacksmiths here at the fort were very important for being able to create and repair tools for other workers here at the fort and things like doorknobs, door handles, hinges, all sorts of materials. And so let's take a closer look here at one of the important tools. So 
raise your hand if you know what this, this anvil is. If you've heard of an anvil, if you know what it's used for. Anvils are definitely used with a lot of blacksmiths still today. Um, and they were very important for being able to manipulate the iron that was hot and be able to twist it around. So you're going to notice that there is this part right here is called the horn. And it helps the blacksmith to be able to manipulate that hot metal. But how is that metal getting hot? Well, you've got your forge over there. So that forge is really, really hot. Um, this one primarily being heated with coal or charcoal. And so you're heating that fire and you're using the bellows and pumping that wooden arm up and down to be able to pump air and help fuel the fire. And so you stick your piece of metal into that hot fire to be able to get it to a point where it can be twisted and manipulated to be able to make a variety of things. And so you're going to notice that you might be able to see some various metal equipment in the background as well. So let's see here. What type of equipment, what type of tools do you think were important for the blacksmith to create for other workers? Let's think on that. So we've got, got farming equipment, right? That's gonna be very important. We've got, let's see, hammers, mallets, all sorts of tools. Then also helping to repair parts, like on our wagon, right? Um, so on a wagon, on a cart, there's gonna be various metal components that might need repairing. And so the blacksmiths are essential out here. They're gonna help, um, with the vaqueros, helping create some of their equipment, helping coopers and carpenters and all sorts of other workers here at the fort. But what about today? Raise your hand if you've ever met a blacksmith working today in modern times, because we still have blacksmiths around, but they work a little bit differently today. So how would a blacksmith be working today? They might be working with a different type of forge, a different type of fuel, like maybe propane. And they might be doing some other more specialized um, works. So decorative wrought iron gates, um, decorative gardening equipment or gardening um, decorations. And what about helping with um, creating different tools such as a music stand or something like that. So blacksmiths today can get pretty creative with some of their creations. Now, let's see here. Who has ever heard of person who shoes horses. Farrier. Who's ever heard of a person who has shooed horses? Maybe you know someone who shoes horses for a living. Yeah. So that's another component of blacksmithing work, right? So that's a little bit about how blacksmiths connect to today, but Blacksmiths were essential here at the fort. And it was one of the first jobs here at the fort when the fort was established. And it was one of the last jobs here at the fort before it was abandoned in 1850.
So definitely a very, very important position here. Now, I noticed the lighting is being a little bit difficult here, um, but we will be heading to another room here shortly. And it's gonna have to do with that agriculture industry I was talking about. So I want you to think about what um, a vaquero is. A lot of you probably know what a vaquero does, what their role is. And we're going to go and walk into a room that represents what their um, living barracks and would have looked like and what the tools of their trade are. So let's walk over that way. I'm going to change the view here for you again so you can see what I am seeing. I don't know about where you are today, but here in Sacramento, it is getting pretty warm. It's supposed to be in the mid 90s today. So it's definitely nice for us to be able to walk into these cooler rooms. So let's take a walk into the Vaquera room. And with that piece of paper you might have, Go ahead and jot down what you notice and what types of tools you think are important to the job of a vaquero. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the view around for you again. As we mention what a vaquero is. So a vaquero, Spanish for cowboy. So you might be wondering, why does John Sutter have cowboys here at his fort? Well, by the year of 1846, John Sutter had 10,000 cattle. That is a lot of cattle but he had that many cattle for a very important reason. Because in Mexican California, Alta California, in the 1830s, 1840s, very important trade was going on called the hide and tallow trade, which was very important with the cattle industry. So the hide and tallow trade comprised of one, the cow hides, and two, the tallow or the rendered down cow fat. Now I want you to write down what you think they might be doing with the rendered down cow fat, the tallow. And I'm also going to show you a cow hide. Now, another word for these cow hides is California banknote. Now, when I think of a banknote, I'm more likely to think of paper money, right? But this is a cow hide, cow skin, and it's being treated like currency in many ways. So let's take a look at this cow hide, and I will turn the view for you again. All right. Bear with me here as I maneuver the tripod, but. Here we are, this cow hide. You're gonna notice something, potentially. There is a brand here in the hide. Now, Sutter also had his own brand. And I will show you that in a moment here. But before I show you this cow hide, his brand, I'm gonna show you what one of the materials that the tallow was being used for. So I'm gonna change the view here again for you. Now, so remember I told you to write down what you think tallow would be used for. One of those things would be candles. The other thing, something that hopefully you're using a lot of today, right? being told to wash our hands with soap and water right now, especially. So that thing the towel is being used for is soap.
Now just imagine washing yourself, washing your hands with this type of soap, but feels and honestly smells a lot like just your regular bar of soap. You'd probably be buying at your grocery store or your supermarket today. So it's really not that different. So that's the main reason why vaqueros were taking care of the cattle here at Sutter's Fort was focusing on those two products, right? But we're not gonna be wasting all of the cow. So certainly I'm sure there was meat stew for days. You could also be drying the meat, salting it, turning it into beef jerky would be a really good way to make use of that as best as possible. But there's another part of the cow that we can use. That is their horn. So I am gonna show you one of those horns and their horns are hollow on the inside. So I'm gonna do my best to show you the hollow part of this cow horn. So what are we gonna do with this? Well, you can carve into it and make an eating utensil, like a spoon, right? Um, you could also cut this part off and then shave this down so it's all even. And you'd create caps on either side so that you could have a powder horn for your black powder when you're going out on your hunting expeditions so that we can be able to provide for our families, right? But what else could we make with our cow horns? People would also make combs for their hair with these horns. And so these materials were used um, to the best of their ability. So I pointed out that cow or that brand on that cow hide. And I told you to think of what letters you think John Sutter would have in his cow brand. And I'm going to show you something that we typically show in person with you all. And this is what we carved onto a board here to show you what John Sutter's cattle brand looks like. So you're gonna notice, hopefully, three letters. So write down what three letters you think are on this cattle brand. So we've got a J for John and a a, an A for what? An A for Augustus, so John Augustus, and an S for Sutter. So hopefully you could see those three letters with John Sutter's cattle brand. But what do cattle brands look like? Let me show you. And this is where the blacksmith is helping the vaqueros out with some of their job by creating some of their tools. So this is what a cattle brand looks like. Some of them are short and have a short end to hold on to. Some of them have very long um, arms, arm ends. Um, but this is what the branding end of the branding iron looks like. And so raise your hand if you ever seen a branding iron or if you know what a branding iron does. Go ahead and raise your hand if you know what a branding iron does, how you use it. Okay, good, good. So we want to be getting coals, fire. We want to get this end red hot to be able to mark our cattle. But why are we marking our cattle with a brand? And write down why you think that. We're marking our cattle with a brand so that we can identify whose cattle belongs to who. Because Sutter was not the only person in California participating in this hide and tallow trade. So it's important to be able to identify 
your cattle because if some of them get loose and make it to another ranch and mix up with some of the other cattle with the other ranch, it's going to be important to be able to easily identify whose cattle belongs to which ranch. So that's part of the reason why we're, why we're using these branding irons. Now today, you might see cows along the highway, on farms, on ranches, with a tag on their ear to help identify who they are, right? So we still identify the animals in and the livestock in the agricultural industries today, but sometimes it's a little different. But what other tools do the vaqueros have? So let's take a look at this rayada. Now I'm going to transition the camera here again for you so that we can take a closer look at the rayada on the saddle. So we've got saddles because we need to be able to ride our horses and be able to make it around our cattle a lot faster, right? Take a look at this rayada, this lasso. That is definitely some craftsmanship to be able to braid that raw hide so tightly together. So I'm also gonna point out here to you a couple other tools. We've got some spurs. Now, write down also what materials other than say rawhide you think ropes can be made out of. Brought rawhide, which is the, comes from the hide and you've tanned it out, you've dried it out. Now, what material do you think this might be? That is horse hair. So you could make your ropes um, that you're needing with all sorts of material, whether it's rawhide, horse hair. Um, you might be able to see off in the distance over there that we've got some bridles for our horses. So I want you to think a little bit about how the job of a vaquero, a cowboy in the 1840s might be a little bit different today. How do you think the job of a vaquero, a cowboy, might be a little bit different today, in 2020? Well, we certainly do have people um, with the cattle industry, right? But the cattle industry looks a little bit different today. And so the agriculture industry, the cattle industry is certainly still um, very important to our economies today, to our livelihoods, but it's changed. There's a lot more mechanisms in place. There's different ways of herding them up, different ways of tagging them on the ear, right? So still very important to our industries today but we just go about them a little bit differently. So we've talked a little bit about blacksmiths and how they helped out at the fort here. We've also talked a bit here about the vaqueros, about the tools of their trade. Um, but, and actually, we're here inside the walls of the fort, right? But do you think the vaqueros would be spending a lot of time within the walls of the fort? Maybe not. So there's actually the Caro's barracks out beyond the, um, the wall here in the original settlement of the fort. And the Vicaros were often going to be closer to their horses, to the cattle, and caring for them. And so this is just a little hint as to the tools of the trade and how they did their work. But there's more than just the livestock related with the hide and tallow industry. There's also the planted crops that we're gonna talk a little bit about. So before we head over 
to the grist mill. I want you to think about and write down what's a common ingredient that you're gonna be able to find in bread, cookies, some cereal, maybe cinnamon rolls. And it might not be in all the different cookies and things like that, but what's a common ingredient you might find in those um, pastries and those food items? Go ahead and write that down. We are gonna make our way to the grist mill. So if you've written down what you think common ingredient in bread, in cereal, cookies, cinnamon rolls, if you wrote down flour, you would be correct. But how do we get that flour? Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about that over here. Right. So, let's find a level spot to put this tripod here. So, we are here at the grist mill. Now, remember I said, if you said flour, you'd be correct. So, how do we get that flower? Well, it's gonna start with planting and then eventually cultivating wheat crops. So go ahead and raise your hand if you know what wheat looks like. I'm gonna show you. Try and get as close as I can. I know the camera will be a little difficult to focus, but so it starts with cultivating the wheat. And so we need to get to what's in here. We need to get to the seed. And so it's gonna take a long process to get from this to, to seeds. It's not gonna be an easy process. It's gonna take a little bit. But, so we need to go through processes to remove the exterior of the seed, of the wheat berry. So what we want to get to is the wheat berry. And I'm going to show you just how small those materials are. So, that's the wheat berry. I know it's kind of difficult for it to focus on. But that is the wheat berry that we eventually grind down into flour. So I'm going to show you the components of the grist mill, which is a mill for grinding grain. So I'm going to change this view here again for you. Now, we have a few different components here. So we have this black funnel looking device. That is what we call the hopper. And then right beneath the hopper, we have the runner stone, which is attached to this wooden arm. And then beneath the runner stone is the bed stone. So we've got the hopper, the runner stone attached to this wooden arm. And then we've got the bed stone. So those are the three main parts of our grist mill. And so that hopper is where we place the wheat berry. So let me go ahead and point out to you 
where are the wheat berry is in here. So you're gonna notice some of that wheat berry inside the funnel, inside the hopper. But how is it going to be ground down into flour? Well, these stones, the runner and the bedstone, they have some unique valleys and ridges that are, um, that are being connected. So I am going to share an image with you here and bear with me as I get it going for you. But so between these two stones, there are gonna be ridges and valleys. So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you see the image that I am sharing for you. Okay, good, awesome. So I am going to point at the one that I am talking about. So that stone is the one that has these valleys and ridges that are grinding against each other to grind down that wheat berry to turn it into flour. And so you're gonna notice that there are these different lines. And so you're gonna see those are gonna be the valleys that that flour is eventually going to funnel through to make it out so that we can put it into a bucket. And so that is what those two stones look like in the middle where they meet. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. All right, so, but why are we grinding down all this flour? Well, I'm gonna show you one of the end products that you can get using the flour, especially here at the fort. So when you're going out on a long journey, whether it's overland by wagon, when people were taking about six months to get here to Sutter's Fort overland by wagon, or if you're traveling by boat out at sea, you're going to want a consistent source of bread. But if you leave a nice fresh loaf of bread out too long, it's gonna get moldy. And we're gonna be sad that it's moldy and we're not gonna to wanna to eat it because it'll make us sick, right? But there's something here called hard tack or um, also ship's biscuit. It is a very, very hard cracker. Now, taking a moment to focus, but this, the really hard cracker, and I would not recommend just biting into a piece of hard tack because it is going to require an emergency visit to the dentist, and no one likes that. So when you are eating this hard tack, you're going to use something warm, something that's going to soften the cracker. So something like coffee, tea, stew, soup, anything that's that warm, um, texture. But what's in this hard tack? So I mentioned there's flour, there's a little bit of salt, and there's water. And then you bake all of the moisture, all of that water out of that cracker. And as long as you have baked all of that moisture out in your oven, it's going to stay good for months, potentially years. So it's a very stable source of, um, of carbs, which is gonna help you to be able to make it on some of these long journeys. Or if there's just a period of time where fresh loaves of bread are not as accessible as they once were. So hard tack, very important part of what's going on um, here at the fort in the 1840s. And so, this process of growing the wheat crops, of cultivating it, and then going through the process of grinding it down into wheat, 
a very, very important process here at the fort. Now, we mentioned a little bit about the blacksmith, the vaquero, and now here at the grist mill talked a little bit about farming. But how is farming the same or different today? Go ahead and write down how you might think it's similar or different to today. I'm gonna change the view here again so that you can see our grist mill. Raise your hand if you think we're using grist mills like this primarily today in 2020, or if maybe they are a bit different. Go ahead and raise your hand if you think we're using a lot more mechanization, a lot more uh, machines in farming today. Exactly. We're definitely using a lot more machines when we're farming today. And we are using tractors often when we're going out to the fields. Here in California, even today, agriculture is a key industry. Um, if you go down the various highways, you might see rice being grown, might see corn, might see various orchards. So it's definitely still a very important part of industries today, just as it was important to industries here in California in the 1800s. So with that in mind, we wanna talk about a couple other jobs here at the fort. Now, might've noticed some woodworking materials that are, have been made. And go ahead and write down what job you think would be done with woodworking. We're gonna walk into that shop here. So if you wrote down carpenter as a woodworker, you would be correct. So we're gonna walk in here. Now, I'd like you to take note of what types of products, what types of materials you think are being made in the carpenter shop. So I see we've got some chairs, certainly have lots of benches. And I see some various tools like saws and I see some mallets. And there's going to be some drills here and other places. There are all sorts of tools here in this carpenter shop. And carpenters, they are craftsmen creating all of these important materials. And I want you to raise your hand if you've heard of a certain carpenter named James Marshall. So raise your hand if you have heard of James Marshall. Very good. Yes. So James Marshall was an important carpenter here at the fort who later made out an agreement to work on making a sawmill up in what is now Coloma. Uh, today that is about 45 minute drive from Sacramento, from Sutter's Fort, but it would have been a little bit longer journey at that time. So let's think about all the different materials here. And what else do you think carpenters are making? So you mentioned chairs, benches, they're gonna be making tables. What about cabinets? Definitely cabinets. And let's see here. Do you think barrels are going to be important? Barrels are definitely going to be important, but there's a special type of job here at the fort that makes barrels. And we'll get to that one briefly a little bit later. But so we've got 
carpenters here working on all sorts of material or projects. And raise your hand if you have ever met or seen or known a carpenter today. Raise your hand if you've ever known a carpenter. Maybe you're one of your parents works as a carpenter. Maybe your uncle, a family friend. Yeah, I see lots of hands raised. Great. So carpenters are still an important part of the workforce here in 2020 today, just as they're important in the 1840s. But they're going to be doing sometimes a little bit of different things, but a lot of times just with different tools. So tools today, um, in many aspects, are starting to become a little bit more universal with some things, um, which is very handy. But we're also using more mechanized materials with our drills and with our saws. So there's some changes, but carpenters are still around. And in many aspects, you still have the apprenticeships occurring in today's carpenters as you would have in the 1800s. So you would start as an apprentice and work your way through and hopefully with the goal of being a master carpenter or a master um, cooper, etc. So there's still a lot of these similarities in some of these trades and crafts today. So do think about that. Now, I'm going to walk us over to a shady spot here. We're going to talk about another um, important job here at the fort. Now, mentioned we're not right next to the ocean, right? But we are near rivers. We're not next to a river. We are near rivers. So, Sailors are going to be vital employees here for John Sutter because as we were talking about the agriculture industry and the blacksmiths helping out, the carpenters being essential, there's products being made here at the fort with these raw goods. So we've got the wheat fields that are growing out beyond the fort's walls here. We've got the various products from the cows and then various just materials that are being made. So blacksmith making nails and other materials. But how are the products that are being made to go out to sell to market? How are they going to get anywhere? That's where the role of the sailor comes into play. Sailors were vital employees to John Sutter because they were able to transport these goods and materials out of the fort here, along the riverway, out to Yerba Buena or San Francisco today. And they were also able to then transport back goods and materials that you otherwise can't access here in the interior of California. <clears throat> and so Sailors, go ahead and raise your hand if you think sailors had a wide variety of skill set and knowledge. Go ahead and raise your hand if you think sailors had a wide variety of skill set. Absolutely, yes, that is great. So, sailors, oftentimes you'd have blacksmiths aboard a sailing vessel, you would have farmers if there were livestock on board. You'd have carpenters, you would have coopers. Okay, pause, what's a cooper? A cooper makes things like barrels, buckets, butter churns. So barrels being key here because that's going to be a very good way to transport our goods and materials. Now I am going to show you real quick an image of what is called a block and tackle system. And that was very important for sailors here 
because they were able to, and go ahead and raise those virtual hands for me. If you can see the image I am sharing with you. So you're gonna see a barrel attached to a pulley system. And so that pulley system is what we call the block and tackle. And that's going to make it so that by using this rope that is right there, by using that rope, one person is gonna be able to pull on that rope and lift the barrel up. Now, why are we going to want to lift this barrel up? Well, we're gonna to wanna to get it onto a cart, onto a wagon, onto something to transport that barrel to a boat at the Embarcadero and then be able to take that and all the other products out to their next destination. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to video here. So that is one contraption, one method um, that sailors were using to more efficiently move their barrels and transport these goods and materials. But why else are we using barrels? Well, you can put them on their side to move them and roll them up a ramp, down a ramp. And so they were, it was much more easy to transport rather than big wooden crates that would be very heavy and much more difficult to move, especially move efficiently. So sailors, they were good for transporting these goods and materials, knowing how to navigate the waterways, but also think of these sailing vessels as floating cities. So that's why we're going to have a blacksmith on board, a cook on board, uh, probably multiple cooks. And we're going to have farmers if, we've got, if we're transporting livestock, because those farmers are more likely to know how to properly care for the livestock. And in addition, these sailors are going to know how to repair and fix ropes and canvas and all these materials that are essential for these sailing vessels to work. And so by transporting goods and materials to and from the fort here, they were just vital to the enterprise going on here. But do we have sailors today? Absolutely, there are definitely sailors today working in our economies. So raise your hand if you can think of a way that a sailor might be working in 2020. Maybe not here at the fort, but elsewhere in the world. Raise your hand if you can think of a way sailors would be working in 2020. Okay, good. So think about navies around the world but also think about other sailing vessels like cruise ships, um, transporting cargo on those really large vessels to transport things like cars. So you're gonna have skilled people knowing how to navigate the seas working on these sailing vessels today and engineers to be able to properly use the technology that's going on and you're also going to be able to, well, you will have cooks, chefs, people to feed all of the crew on board. And if you have guests, if you're on a cruise ship, right? So all of these careers, jobs at the fort still have a part in our economies and our lives today. And you might have parents, you might have friends who are involved in some of these different jobs. So the jobs are just a little bit more complicated in some ways today with our technologies, our different machines that we're using today, but still just as vital to our daily life. Now, I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you think you would have been a farmer in the 1840s. Go ahead and raise your hand if you think you would have been a farmer in the 1840s. Okay, good. What about a carpenter? 
Raise your hand if you think you would have been a carpenter in the 1840s. Good, good. What about a blacksmith in creating the tools and using the forge? About a blacksmith. If you think you would be a blacksmith in the 1840s. Awesome. Okay, now last but not least, do you think you would be a, um, a vaquero in the 1840s? Or a cowboy herding around the cattle? Yeah, okay. Last but not least, sailor. Do you think you would be a sailor in the 1840s? Living a lot of your time out on the water. Okay, yeah, great. So that's honestly just a small little glimpse as to what jobs were crucial here at the fort. There are so many other jobs that were important. Uh, I briefly mentioned the coopers making barrels, but they could help make buckets and butter churns and various containers similar to those. Um, you have um, the clerk, you've got doctors, all sorts of people working here at the fort in various occupations, bakers, cooks. So I hope that gave you a little glimpse as to what was going on here in the 1840s and how that connects a little bit today. And I'm going to walk us out here real quick before we end so that you can see a little bit about what I was talking about with these modern buildings. So I'm going to go ahead and change the view again and take a look at the modern buildings that are going up beyond the fort here. And make some notes. And so I'm gonna say thank you all for joining me today here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park for the Ports Home Learning Program. And do check out other Ports Home Learning Programs on the Ports website and check out Sutter's Fort um, with our YouTube page, with our Facebook, our Instagram, as well as Ports and their social media as well. Thank you for joining me here today, and I hope you all are staying safe and staying healthy, and glad I could bring the fort virtually to all of you in your homes today. And again, stay safe out there. Until next time. Bye, everybody.